Welcome to the Life Success and Legacy Podcast. We're super excited. We are taking on a worthwhile endeavor at Life Success and Legacy. Our intention is to honor Nelson Nash, the man, as well as the infinite banking concept. We're going to create a series of resources, including podcasts and text, as a resource for others who want to truly understand with depth and clarity what Nelson shared in his book, Becoming Your Own Banker as well as the many seminars and think tanks that we were fortunate to have attended during his life. So who is this intended audience? Well, we will use Nelson Nash's own words. It is written for the layman, not for financial advisors, but all life agents should be thoroughly knowledgeable of its content and practice. So whether you are an individual, part of a family, a business owner, or a life insurance agent, this is for you. So sit back, relax, and we will walk you through becoming your own banker step by step so you can reference the parts you want to revisit at your own pace. And we might have a little fun along the way. Hey, good morning, everybody. We are, uh, we are trying to stay dry here in Lawrence, America. We have been rained on a lot. We want to welcome you to uh, our next uh, episode of the Life Success and Legacy podcast. Chris Bay here with Michael K. Everett. Good morning. Everett. How are you, sir? Good, good. You keeping that sump pump running? Uh, I actually, I have a, uh, I have a one horsepower unit on its way. I ordered a bigger, a, a, a double the size horsepower sump pump. I'm not playing around anymore. Bigger is better. If any of you ever want to have a conversation with Mike Everett in the springtime when it's raining here in Kansas, mm. your likelihood of having a conversation about his sump pump is probably nine to 10 chance, nine out of 10 chances. Oh, it's a hundred percent right now. <laughs> it's a hundred percent. We all have our things, don't we? Oh, buddy. I'm there. It's either It's either golf or sump pumps this time of year. Come on. Come on. I'm on. <laughs> Well, um, we're excited to get into, into this. We were just having a conversation before we uh, pressed record with Mike Crawford on our team who makes, us, makes this podcast actually appear out there so people can get to listen to it. And we were talking about this section. We are on page 41 uh, of Becoming Your Own Banker, and we are in the fifth edition. And again, <laughs> we always recommend you get a copy of this book if you don't have one. I would say especially for this section um, mm -hmm. because I don't know how you get through this section without uh, a copy of the book because there's just so much detail and there's we start to get into charts and such and you guys are going to get to see um, why we wanted to do this especially Mike Everett um, because of his um, close relationship with Nelson Nash and then also the level of learning listening I should say and learning and then digging in on his own and then finding questions and having conversations with Nelson. I think that's really going to come to even a higher level of awareness uh, during this section because it gets pretty detailed. We're on part three of page 41, how to start building your own banking system. And um, this section, Mike, I, I, can't, <laughs> I can't tell you how many times somebody has asked why would I take a loan against my policy from the life insurance company at a higher percent interest rate potentially, not always, but potentially, when I could get a lower interest rate if I took a loan from the bank or the car dealership to purchase a car? That question comes up so many times. Time after it, time after time. And it is hard when... When we've got, we talk about these ruts, right? Yep. Yep. We got these ruts in our brains, just like driving the tractor down the fence row for year after year after mm -hmm. year. You get to the point where you don't even have to steer that tractor. It just goes down those ruts, right? And that's kind of what happens with the way we've been taught to think about money and all the, the information that is out there from financial, as, we, as Nelson would say, financial gurus, right? Yeah. It is hard to shift out of those ruts. So 
Well, Mike, I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw, um, let me throw something in. out real quick as, as we're starting to think about this particular chapter. Number one, this book was written in 99 and produced in 2000. And what were interest rates during that time frame? They were higher. Yeah. They were higher, but yet Nelson utilized this particular section and showed people that even the high interest rates don't make any sense. So, and I love this. I can't believe I'm doing a Chris Bay right now. This book is not about investments of any kind. It's about how one finances the things of life, which can certainly include investments. It is not about rates of return. As time, as time goes by, interest rates are up, interest rates are, are down. But the process of banking goes on no matter what is happening. I just pulled a Chris Bay there, by the way. And looks so, good on you. So part of the reason why people are so hung up on it is because they're so used to, and I'm going to just jump right into the ruts in their brain. They're so used to, especially during this particular time frame, because what the government has done is they have held interest rates historically low. It is not reality, by the way, but let's just stay here for a second. So I can go out and borrow money from a conventional bank and or a uh, auto finance company at almost nothing. But yet if I'm borrowing money from one of those entities and I make those monthly payments, and I don't care whether it's 48, 60, 72 months, it makes no difference to me. When they make those payments, do they ever see those payments again? Never. So this is people's hang up. They get in here and they go, you know what? The insurance company is charging, I, I don't care, four to 6%. With one of the companies that we utilize, it's 4.76%. That is like a stop sign to most people. They get stuck. They go, why in the world would I borrow money at 4.76 when I can go over here and borrow it at one point nothing? And this is our answer. <laughs> Today's if, podcast. <laughs> I'm telling you. So we're going to get to the bottom line really early in the podcast. So you make those payments to yourself and here's the awesome thing. The minute you make those payments to yourself, you can reuse those dollars again. I, this is not rocket science what we're doing, but yet people's hang up. I'm gonna tell you, this was actually the chapter for me that all of the lights in my brain came on. And I thought, Oh my gosh, you know, in this particular example, we're going to utilize, you know, a 44 year time frame. We're going to pay, make payments and 11 cars. And at the time I read this chapter, I had actually financed or leased 16 cars. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh my gosh. Now I am way ahead in the chapter, by the way. That's all right. But, That's all right. But, you know, I got excited there for a second. I know you did. Sorry. So, um, so bottom line, I think if I hear you correctly, you're saying it's way more important and beneficial for someone to control the environment. If we go back to the airplane, yep, it's way more important for the, for a person to control the environment of the airplane, rather than trying to simply get their airplane to go three, four, five, 10% faster. That's right. Okay. So, Mike, I want you to take us back. Nelson opens up this chapter saying, recalling the mountain of interest that the all-American man is paying. And this is back on page 17. Mm -hmm. and I know you know this stuff inside and out. <clears throat> take us back and paint a picture for this all-American for us. Well, so you got, you got this 29-year-old guy or 28-year-old guy. I can't ever remember. He's 28 or 29. But he's, he's paying interest on a mortgage. He's paying interest on credit cards. He's paying interest on conventional loans. He's paying interest on uh, a car loan. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the amount of interest that he's paying, it's unbelievable. But here's the, here's the awesome thing. 
you know, when you start talking to somebody about dividend paying whole life insurance, there is a roadblock there versus this guy's not afraid to spend 250, 260, 275 dollars a month on a car payment, and he doesn't think anything about it. But yet, if you look at the way we've done cars, because this is really a uh, this is the five methods of the use of an automobile. That's the chapter. This is what we're doing and how to build our system. Um, they don't even think about the interest. And then when they trade the car in, 90% of the time, the car isn't even paid off. So it is an ongoing thing throughout the entirety of their life. And they never get out from underneath it. So let's look at the All-American, right, that you just described. And he's got this laundry list of debts, right? Yep. yep. And, and Nelson says um, a huge amount is being paid on the mortgage on his house. And, and the guy concludes, well, that's where I had to start. And this kind of ties into how we design <laughs> strategies using our software <laughs> yeah. and such. Can you describe a little bit how does a person start when you're looking at this laundry list of debts? Well, it's better to, it just says right here, it's better to attack an area that's attainable, that's fairly short. And usually, and I'm just saying, usually the car loan is usually the shortest. Mm. So, you know, when we start looking at, at um, loans, debt, we want to, we want to utilize one of the smallest or shortest loans to attack because, you know, and you've heard me say this a hundred times, life is full of victories and defeats. We just want our victories to outweigh our defeats. So if we can start by attacking, let's say, a small credit card or a car loan or a, a small student loan, then all of a sudden, those payments that they're paying whatever they're paying, the car loan company, the, uh, the student loan company, whatever, um, they can now turn those, you know, controlling the environment now we're talking about. Changing the they, wind current. That's it. They can now start to make those payments to themselves. And um, it, it, it really flips everything on its head, everything that we've learned about money so quickly because you know, once again, it's about controlling the environment yeah. and not trying to make things go faster. You know, the, the financial gurus out there are saying, oh, I can get you two, five, 10 percent more on your portfolio. Well, you're still fighting that wind current with the debts that we have in mm -hmm. this life. So coming from a Dave Ramsey uh, background experience, yep. you know, for seven years, what you're describing is when you're looking at that laundry list of debts is is really what Dave would call is the uh, the snowball, right? Yep. Yep. And, and really, what it is is ticking off those smaller debts quicker. And and the language we use is changing the wind current of that cash. We would say rather than turning that payment on, let's say you pay off a credit card, and with Dave Ramsey, you would immediately add that payment to the next credit card or car loan That's and start correct. attacking that. What yep. we recommend and what we show with our software is we then change the wind current on that and run that money through your banking system where you get multiple uses of those dollars. Yep. Then we'll chunk down on the debts, just like Dave Ramsey would show. However, we're now gaining three uses of your dollars yep. and not interrupting the compounding interest. So Mike, now what we're going to do is we're going to transition. And if, if someone has a, if they have a book on page 41, we're looking kind of at figure one. I want you to describe um, what we're looking at with these cars, kind of paint a picture for what we're going to be digging into it in pretty uh, great detail. Well, basically what you're looking at here is the five different ways you can use an automobile over a certain time period. You've got the lease method. Uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. You're going to lease cars. And we're going to just do this out the entirety of your life. Then you have uh, the bank method, which is really you're just utilizing a conventional bank to finance your automobiles. Then you have the cash method, which is really you're saving up money. That's called the sinking fund. You're saving up money. You're buying a car. You're saving up money. You're buying a car. And then you have the CD method, which we show in, in different ways. But what you're going to do is 
you're going to capitalize a certificate of deposit and utilize that as your equity source, but then borrow money from the conventional bank, utilizing the CD as collateral. And then you have the infinite banking method, which really you're doing the same thing as the CD method, but you're utilizing a dividend paying whole life insurance policy to learn how to finance your own vehicles or use your own vehicles. Nelson was always kind of careful in his uh, verbiage because really what we're doing is you and I buy cars, we use them and then we trade them in and we get another one and we use another one. And that's what we do throughout the entirety of our lives. So these are the five different methods of the way you would use an automobile. But what we've done is Nelson is now turning around and utilizing a 44 year time period to give some clarity Mm -hmm. as to where our money is coming and going. So if we look at the five uses that you just described, three of which you do not control the banking function. Somebody else is controlling the banking function. That's right. The last two are giving examples of how an individual could actually control the banking function in the use of vehicles, correct? That's correct. Okay. So let's dig into uh, method A, lease method, okay? okay? And again, the details of this is we're looking at a 44-year period, right? That's right. Okay. We're financing 11 cars, and we're just basically going to uh, lease one. The start, you remember, you don't have to have any money down. You just go in and you lease it. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to trade that car back in every four years for 44 years. So you're going to do 11 cars over this time period. Okay. So that one's pretty straightforward. Method B, we're in the second column now. That's method right. B is using the commercial bank method, which I, I'm guessing most people are familiar with the first method, the leasing, and then also the second one. Can you dig us, paint a little bit of a picture here on the method B, the second method where we're using the bank? Because um, he starts to talk about payments and, and those sorts of things. Well, in fact, remember the, the, the car value he is utilizing in this particular example is $10,550. So we're financing this car over a four year period, 48 months. So the car payment that they are making to the finance company, this is method B, you go down, you borrow the money and you go purchase your car. And then now what you're gonna do is you're gonna basically make a $260 a month payment back to the commercial financing company or the commercial bank. Mm -hmm. um, you literally, and I'm going to tell you, you could probably go down and ask any commercial lender. You could go down and ask any automobile financing company, what percentage of cars are paid off when people come back in? I think you would find that less than 50% of the cars are paid for when they come back in and finance a car. Mm -hmm. We just keep um, so, cycling them. It is a perpetual cost. And so when you and I, uh, I'm just gonna use us as an example. Mm -hmm. When we go down and we trade in a car, do we get a lesser value car or do we get a more expensive value car? <laughs> well, a luxury once enjoyed becomes a necessity. Let's just get it out there. Page 28, Parkinson's Law. We're, we're gonna get a nicer car. So this number, in the book, never really changes, but in all reality, it, common sense would tell you that you're gonna get a nicer car. Yeah. So. so so, number one, leasing, it's just it's just cash out. You don't walk away with anything. It is 100% losing cause. With the finance at the bank, they're controlling the banking function, yep. right? We're yep. making payments to them, which we never see that money again right? And That's in most right. cases, those cars don't get paid off. And then we upgrade and go get another car to replace that one. That's right. Okay. So 
Any any last words on on the bank method before we go to the third uh, method C? No, the, the bank method is pretty. It's pretty simple. Yeah, people understand that because that's what people do. Okay. Method C, this is the Dave Ramsey's of the world. This is save up and pay cash for vehicles, right? This was Chris Bay when I met him. That is absolutely correct. <laughs> we like to buy um, old model, high mileage vehicles that you got to repair and make sure you've got AAA for your wife so she doesn't get stranded on the side of the road, right? That's, That's the life right. we were living. That's right. <laughs> So um, this cash method, um, really what we're talking about is saving up and paying cash so that you're saving the interest. Yep, yep. Okay. Point though, if I've got money saved up and I go pay cash for that vehicle, one, I don't get to see that cash anymore. And number two, I have killed any compounding interest on that money. That's right. And the, the, the big caveat in this whole thing is you have to defer the purchase of that car for at least four years while you're saving that money. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a really, really, really slow gratification of getting that car. Doesn't work it's, for you, I bet. No, it does not. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the, the thought process is you are, even when you pay cash for a vehicle, you are making a car payment you're just making the car payment before you actually get the use of the car. That's right. Because you're saving up. That, so it's that's a car right. payment, a car payment, a car payment, and you're building up that cash that you have to go pay cash for the vehicle. That, that's exactly right. Okay. And as you mentioned earlier, I'm now over on page 42 at the top. Uh, you mentioned earlier the sinking fund, which is, you know, save up, go pay cash. Boom. Save up, go pay cash. Again, interrupting that compounding interest. You know, right. one of the statements in this particular section is with the three methods that we've talked about, the lease, the bank, cash, Nelson states in here that we have probably covered at least 90% of the population. I think that we've probably covered 97 to 98% of the population. Yeah. Yeah. So- and, um he also quotes, now obviously the book was written in 2000, but he says leasing is, was up 35% mm. uh, in the last few years, according to many radio commercials. So, Oh, it's higher than that now. I would imagine. Yeah, so. I bet you you're in the 50 to 60% because CPAs are showing their uh, clients how to deduct the payment, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. And we could get into a whole different thought process there, <clears throat> but uh it's all a bunch of garbage. So these <laughs> next two methods are really the um, the guts of this chapter. Yep. And, and they are painting a picture of how a person could control um, their environment and, and take control of the banking function. Um, there are a variety of ways that a person could control their banking function. Yep. You can, you, you can create a bank using your savings account. You could create a banking system doing a 401k, yep. a Roth, um, a variety of ways. Nelson's going to demonstrate here, and Mike's going to talk us through, the first of these two ways is utilizing a CD to build up equity or collateral to then use for loans. And then the second method that we're going to get into, which is method, um, the last method, is going to be, that's method E, is going to be the IBC using mm -hmm. whole life. And we'll get to contrast those two. So Mike, paint a picture for us. Give us some details on method D. Um, well, so this is the CD method. So basically uh, the first three methods have really not addressed and it states it right here in the book, the need for capitalization. So there has got to be a pool created. A pool of money has to be accumulated before doing this. So in the CD method, basically what you're doing, and we show this with some numbers in one of our webinars, but literally what you're doing is you are saving money systematically, just like you would for a 401k or your savings account. But now what you're doing is you're saving this money. And then what you're gonna do is you're going to purchase a certificate of a deposit, CD. And then what you're going to do is you're going to utilize the CD, once that money is accumulated, you're going to use that CD as collateral 
instead of the car. Mm -hmm. Now, for somebody who's thinking through this with us, I'm going to tell you something just happened in your brain and you're going, what? We're going to use a CD as collateral and not the car. So you're taking this pool of money, you're putting it on deposit with the bank. And then they are using the CD as collateral. They are going over to their larger pool and they are loaning you money so you can go out and purchase your vehicle. But the CD is collateral and the car is literally free from a lien. It's a different thought process. Now, Mike, in order to purchase that CD, going back to the grocery store example and how you know most businesses don't make money for the first five to seven years, right? there is a capitalization phase to do that. That's right. Right. And, yeah. and so just like paying cash for a vehicle, you've got to capitalize. You've got to build up a pool to utilize for this purpose. That's correct. Okay. But once you've done that, you get to control the environment. You totally control the environment. The only, uh, the only real downside is once you put that CD up for collateral, you don't have access to that cash or that CD until the car is paid off. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a, a negative light shown on the fact that, yeah, you are sort of con controlling that environment, but you're not controlling 100% of the cash flow of that pool yet. It's way, way better than the first three methods. But there is a better way. And, and we say oftentimes that IBC can work for everyone, but it's not for everyone. And I think this is where Parkinson's law comes into play when That's we talk right. about capitalization. You know, if a person is not able or willing to capitalize and to build their system early on, um, IBC may not be for them. We know this. I'm yeah. telling you what well, we've experienced it with an awful lot of people. Okay. Um, now, when we talk about, um, Mike, do you want to get into the details? I'm down at the, the last paragraph of page 42. And he's talking about the Willie Sutton types, the internal revenue sis, uh, service. They will take 30% of the earnings. The net effect is that this will earn 4% after taxes. So he's talking about the CD and the <laughs> yeah, earnings and yeah. all that. Well, the downside, the downside of the CD is you, you, you throw the CD in the bank and it, it actually grows and compounds over whatever your time frame is. But good, bad, or indifferent every year when the growth happens on that CD, you get this wonderful little interest form from the bank and you've got to pay income taxes on the growth. So that's a downside of utilizing the CD. Mm -hmm. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this again, it's still a whole lot better than the lease, the bank or the cash method because you are still experiencing growth. Yes, you gotta pay some taxes, but now, that's the way it second, is. Hang on a second, Mike. Because CDs right now, they're not earning hardly anything. One point nothing. Why would I put money into a CD that's earning so little? And we have interest rates that are so little where I could borrow that money from the bank to purchase the car. Well, <laughs> the positive the positive thing, you are a, ra you're a rascal. <laughs> um, the positive thing is, even though you're still utilizing a CD with absolutely almost no interest at all growth, you are still making those payments back to the financial institution. So let's just say we did this over four years. Right. We have a CD that's making nothing. We're still having to pay a little bit more than what our CD is, is uh, making. But at the end of the four years, let's just say you took the car payments and you made the car payments on time and you paid the car off in four years at the end of the four years do you have a car that's paid for 
Absolutely. Do you have a CD that has earned interest? So do you have all of your money plus interest? It is a win-win in that particular case. But I guess the, the question remains, is there a better way? That's right. That's right. Okay. You want to jump into method E? Well, method E is, is the fifth method, and it's utilizing a dividend-paying whole life insurance. So we've got to kind of step back a little bit and think about capitalization again. So in a dividend-paying whole life insurance policy, do we still have to make premium payments or capitalize our life insurance policy? Absolutely. Yeah. So now keep in mind, we've gone through this in previous podcasts, but during that capitalization period, we're talking about re-engineering the way the premium is allocated for that particular policy. So I, I'm gonna go back and make a couple of statements just because I want to refresh people's memory if I had to ask everybody listening right now, what was more important to them, cash or life insurance, what would everybody say? Cash. Mm -hmm. So we've taken the base and lowered the base premium and we've flood loaded the paid up additions rider to create more cash value inside the policy. So what we're doing is we're utilizing this whole life insurance policy is just a depository, a place to park some cash, but yet we have to be realistic and help people understand we have to build the pool of cash before we access it. It's the same in a savings account. It's the same in the certificate of deposit, but the awesome thing is you're utilizing a old school life insurance policy that's been rearranged the way the premium is, do you have cash when you capitalize it? Absolutely. Do you have access to that cash value through a policy loan? Absolutely. Yeah. Do you also have life insurance in place in case if something happened to you, somebody you loved would get a death benefit? But then here's the awesome thing. If you have a life insurance policy, you're doing the same thing as the certificate of deposit. You're actually utilizing that as an equity source. <clears throat> you go over to the company now, the company loans you money for whatever equity you have in that policy. And then they loan you the money at 4.76%. You can go out and get your car, but here is the awesome thing. Your equity source, the policy cash value is still growing and compounding like you never touched it. It's unbelievable. And there's another piece that I think when you compare the two, one is yes, your, your policy is still growing and compounding as if you never touched it. But when you look at the payments and who controls the payments, if you're using a CD as collateral at the bank, who is controlling the terms of the payments? The bank controls the entire thing. Okay, Mike, now contrast that because this to me is huge is the freedom. Contrast that to an IBC loan. So who owns the policy? The owner of the policy. The owner of the policy. So here's where the, 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 the big crux of things goes. The owner of the policy has absolute control of all of the functions of what goes on. They have, they literally control, Nelson says they control the entire scene. They have, they own the policy. They've saved the money. They've borrowed money from the life insurance company, but yet the, the policy is continuing to grow and grow and compound. Who gets to decide the terms of the payments? You do, the owner of the policy. So if you've got somebody who, and we were talking about starting with the 
smaller loans and moving up to the bigger loans. If let's say you have a loan at a conventional bank and we are able to pay off that conventional bank and you, your payment I'm just going to use is $500 a month. And that $500 a month is stressing you out. Do you have to make the $500 a month payment back to the life insurance company for the policy loan on the policy that you own? You do not. So you get to control the amount of money, you get to control the interest rate, and you get to control the monthly payment. And literally, Nelson calls it absolute control. You get to control all the details of everything that happens in that thing. So if you decide to instead do a 48 or a 68, but you want to do a 72 or even longer, an 84 or a 96 month payment, you can do that. But the awesome thing is, as you are making those payments back to your system, back to the life insurance company for the money that you borrowed, you have access to those dollars again for any reason whatsoever. And and that plays really that flexibility with the terms of the of the loans against the policy come into play a lot with family banking, where you have a family member, typically an older generation, who has bought up the debt of a younger generation. Let's That's just right. say they do a car loan. And that young family, I mean, cash flow is super important to them. And so they want their payment as low as possible. Well, when the, the older generation controls that banking function, they can set up the terms of that however they want to set it up. That's right. Another, another example is, let's say my washer and dryer tank or the, the refrigerator tanks, and I've got to take a couple months off from my loan repayments to my own system. I just take a couple months off. I get to control that. You go, thing. yeah, you go take a policy loan and you get yourself a new washer or dryer or refrigerator. And then what you've done is you've created a situation where now, because if you think like a banker, you would have two loans out there. You would have a right. car loan and a and a uh, refrigerator loan, let's say. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden the dollars that are coming back towards your system, your IBC system are larger. Right. Thus you are having access to more dollars. Uh, Nelson calls it a perpetual tailwind. It's, it's really, truly unbelievable. All right. We're, we're going to take a, a 30 second time out go. here. I know for our podcast listeners, they're going to have to wait for this next episode that's coming up. Cause what we're going to do is take this further. We are going to actually go head to head between the CD method and the IBC method. And we're mm. going to dig into some charts here on page 45 uh, 46 and 47. Actually, Mike's going to walk us through comparing side by side the CD method and the IBC method for you guys to really get a handle of the numbers on this. To our listeners, yeah. thanks for joining us. We'll dig in further on this, uh, on this uh, CD compared with the IBC method. Um, as always, we uh, recommend you check out our Life Success Legacy um, website. And we've got various uh, learning tools on that website. If you have not uh, checked it out, our IBC Learning Kit, that's a great way to get a book um, because it's included in the cost of the learning kit. You can either choose Becoming Your Own Banker or the case for IBC. And then uh, we've got additional resources on there as well. So thanks for joining us. We'll catch you next time.